Good evening here from uh, Denmark and uh, welcome to this TouchDFX webinar. Uh, we are getting ready at our end to take you through this webinar today. Uh, we will be live in uh, five minutes um, for the actual webinar. Um, just to give you a quick introduction to, uh, to the GoToMeeting uh, setup we're using, um, you are in listen-only mode, and but you can ask questions and participate in uh, our polls and so on. And we hope you will ask a lot of questions and, uh, of course, participate in the polls we are we're doing. Um, you can see uh, also here we will share a handout later on, which will also appear on the need uh, the question pane. Um, and after the webinar, we will also try to ask or answer all the remaining questions, either by voice or by text. Um, yes. With me today, uh, you can see uh, also Henrik. Hi, Henrik. Hi, everyone. Um, and uh, later on, Henrik will share with you uh, what percentage uh, customers think that companies deliver superior user experience. And before we start the webinar, we would like to just test uh, a poll and uh, and see what uh, you think uh, of, of this. Um, and I'll launch it right now. So you, I hope you can see it. Uh, at what percentage does customers agree that companies deliver superior user experience? And please type in what you think, and uh, we will discover the result uh, later on. Um, and I can see the, the votes are coming already. Uh, yeah, and please uh, do this. While we uh, wait for the result, let's see if Henrik also is ready for, for take you uh, further into this webinar. Um, I hope you are, Henrik. Good. I am. <laughs> Definitely. Great. Um, yes, and uh, two seconds. Uh, in two seconds, we will close the poll and uh, and see what the results are, and then we will start the, the actual webinar. Um, yes, let's close it now, and I will share the result with you. Um, no one thinks eight percent. Forty percent thinks it's thirty-two percent. So, uh, so let's see um, what the actual result will be later on. Um, yes, I'll hide it. Great. Um, uh, I think we will uh, start the webinar now. Uh, welcome to uh, this TouchGFX webinar about embedded GUI design. My name is uh, Soren Mikkelsen, and uh, with me today, uh, behind the scene, we have uh, Kim Jönsson a digital designer uh, from Müller Informatics. Um, I hope you're with us, uh, Kim, uh, and if you are, you can uh, please share your webcam. Um, he's right there. Hi, Kim. Um, so you can actually ask a lot of questions and he will actually be there uh, ready to answer you. Um, great, and last but not least, we have Henrik, which I gave a short introduction to uh, before. Uh, he's a UX designer from Mjolnir Informatics uh, with experience in several uh, embedded uh, projects, ranging from uh, white goods, smart watches to in different industrial products in both the US, Europe and, uh, and Asia and so on. He will be taking you through this webinar today and um, I hope you will enjoy it. Before we uh, start uh, this webinar, it would be nice to us to see what level of experience you have regarding a uh, user experience uh, on embedded devices. So we will launch uh, a poll and uh, now we know it's working. So uh, let's see what the results will be. And uh, I think uh, Henrik will catch you uh, on the right level here. Um, so I'll just launch it right now. I hope you can see it now and uh, please uh, Put in your uh, your vote here, uh, or not your vote, uh, what level you are, and uh, so we have a, a feeling of uh, of where you are, and we are click quickly reaching uh, 70, 80 percent. Um, while we're waiting for a result, uh, there's already a question coming in, and um, he is asking, uh, what is the difference between a UX and designer and a UI designer. Uh, maybe uh, you can answer this, Henrik. Uh, yes, of course. And I see the poll already. I see a few people saying they are they are competent and even proficient in in UX and UI design. So I'll be very excited to to hear your input uh, as we go through. 
Um, the, the difference between the, the UX designer and the UI designer is of course something that can be very, uh, very different uh, according to what company you come from. Uh, in our organization, uh, the user experience designer is usually uh, the, the first one who gets involved with the, with the customer or, um, or with, the, with the users and actually try to narrow down what uh, kind of user experience we're looking for uh, with this product and how we make sure that this product will be uh, will be a success uh, and of course uh, as we we do all sorts of different uh, exercises and use uh, different methods to actually uh, narrow this down and align with the with the customer and align with users gather the feedback uh, this is actually when we when we bring in our ui designers uh, who works uh, usually more detail oriented so after i have done uh, wireframes we have sketched up the uh, the very early uh, skeleton of, of the application and uh, got the initial ideas uh, on board uh, on board and aligned with uh, with the customer this is where the the user interface designer really starts to shine uh, as he'll uh, come in with his uh, thoughts on uh, icono iconography typography uh, colors and really try to to get out the 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 feel and the finish of of the product so in this way we're actually trying to to narrow down uh, what kind of product we're building building slowly, uh, slowly getting more detail as we, as we get to the to the final. Thank you very much, Soren. Um, all right, I'll uh, I'll just uh, go right into it. Um, so today uh, I prepared uh, what I've called five fundamentals for embedded GUI, uh, GUI design. Um, so these uh, different areas is some of the uh, not necessarily uh, covers everything there is to say about GUI design, but it's trying to to cover different different areas uh, that we usually. Uh, uh, want to discuss with customers or where we usually see the pitfalls when, when people uh, embark on uh, an embedded GUI design adventure. Uh, the first one I'll be talking about today is uh, the context and this is of course uh, who are your users, where will they be using your product and really trying to, to define what context this product will be used in. Um, point number two today will be uh, performance and hardware and this is of course something that is uh, pretty unique uh, for embedded GUI design. Um, normally if you're designing a web or mobile you won't really think about uh, how much RAM or how, how big your processor is because things usually usually work and, and perform at a, at, a, at a high level. Uh, of course when we're working with low-cost hardware we, we need to be aware of a few things uh, before we get uh, get started and really get into things. Um, it's not because the low-cost hardware is, uh, is limiting you, uh, but it's because you really want to, to, to make sure you get the best out of, of what we have to work with. All right, um, point number three today is uh, rules and uh, recognizability. Um, of course, when we're working with the embedded GUI design, uh, we have a set of rules and we have some recognizability that we want to work with because usually people come from another world than embedded GUI design. Uh, people's, uh, most people frame of reference come from mobile phones and this is the touch screen that we use to, to working with every day and using every day to check me, uh, social media, check our emails browsing videos or even uh, even texting each other. So there's a lot of uh, knowledge and a lot of rules that we subconsciously follow and subconsciously expect of, of GUI design uh, in embedded products. So this is something we have to keep in mind, mind when we design as well. Then of course we have uh, consistency. You need to be consistent with whatever rules you follow in your application. And this is something uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a, a bit more later on. Later on. Um, and last but not least, we have the responsiveness and the animation. Again, something that we're really used to uh, from mobile phones. Um, of course, the difference is mobile phones, they can get updates each week, each month. So you usually see a lot of different animations in, in the apps that you use every day. Um, in, um, embedded uh, products with lifetimes, uh, lifetime spans on five, 10 or even 15 years, 
it needs to be a bit more you need to be a bit more careful with what animations you choose because what is trendy today might not be trendy next year and certainly not in five years so uh, choosing uh, choosing a careful approach here is, is uh, it, it can be really important of course the responsiveness is is, uh, is quite important as well we want uh, things to be responsive again because this is what we're used to we need to make sure that when i click that button the button tells me that it has been clicked so you constantly need some uh, some feedback loop to actually tell uh, tell the user that uh, that you have registered his actions but let's get started with the first one and this is of course the context and uh, i'll just jump into the slide here um of course the first question you need to be asking yourselves as you start to develop a gui or embedded, embedded product in general is who are your users and what are their needs this is a very very uh, basic stuff for for most designers but it, it can be really uh, daunting if you are maybe you are a, a developer who just got assigned to uh, to doing the the UX or the UI uh, for the new product, and maybe you don't really have the setup in our, your organization to actually get out, talk to users, and really identify the needs. Um, because of course, there's a beautiful videos on YouTube talking uh, talking a lot about how you should do this, but very very uh, often the the reality hits you and you have a you have a budget and it can be really hard to to do this uh, the right way at least the way it is pictured in in all these uh, ideal uh, ideal videos that we see uh, around the web so um, one thing uh, you need to keep in mind as well is that the the consideration about who your users are and what their needs are is not only a job for the user experience designer Usually, the user experience designer is someone who gathers the the information uh, about users, about the domain, uh, but he needs to deliver this to to the rest of the development team as well, uh, and need to keep everyone aligned so everyone knows who they're building this product for. Because when you get everyone on board and get everyone on the right track, that means that every discussion and every decision that you make uh, during development and during the the process, everyone can help each other with actually delivering. Uh, some value for the end user because um, it can be really hard to settle uh, a discussion if it comes down to if one person likes blue and the other one likes red. If you have a user uh, that says that blue is definitely the thing to go for, that's that's probably what you should listen to. Um, of course, um, we uh, we need to uh, we need uh, a bit of uh, a bit of um, I say a bit of argument of, of why do we need to talk to these customers and uh, why do we need to talk to these users and I, I just want to quickly to 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 iterate on this um, so in 2005 uh, a consulting firm called Bain and Company a business consulting firm uh, they did a survey uh, with uh, 362 companies uh, where they asked all the companies uh, firstly are you customer focused and out of uh, all these companies 95% said that they were definitely customer focused of course they would say that because everyone is dependent on their customers they are the main uh, source of income so it, it will be it will be quite odd to say that you weren't then uh, they they asked the, the the companies if they would say that they deliver a superior uh, experience and 80 percent of the companies say that they definitely deliver uh, a superior experience to to their customers uh, CERN uh, started off the, the webinar with a, a small poll uh, asking you how uh, how you think that uh, how many of the customers would actually agree that the companies deliver this and actually see how, how this gap turns out uh, and I actually saw that no one got it right <laughs> surprisingly um, eight percent of customers actually agree that companies deliver a superior experience so we have a major gap here where companies think that they're they are delivering the very utmost uh, experience to their customers but it's rarely that the customers actually agree and this is quite a problem because we really want to close this gap we want the the companies to actually be able to deliver this uh, this uh, experience this superior experience and we want the the customers to agree because this is what uh, will make the customers return and actually keep your business running so the, the um, I think Soren has a, a question for me right here. Uh, yes. Uh, why do you think there's a big gap uh, here? What is the main reason you think? Um, I think uh, 
I'll just unmute myself. <laughs> I, I think the main reason here is is actually that most companies fail to align with uh, the expectations and the needs of their users. Um, this is something that we, we see a lot today. A lot of uh, decisions and discussions, uh, new products are launched, uh, not because they are based on uh, some very grounded uh, user research on how to, how to uh, support the user needs the best. Um, it, it, it can be skewed for a lot of different reasons but I really think it comes down to are you talking enough to your customers and are you really listening to, to what they're saying all right I'll go on um, so the next uh, the next question we can ask here is of course how do we actually close this gap how to, how do we make our company deliver on the superior experience and how do we make our customers agree one uh, approach to this is, of course, look at the eight uh, percent. Look at the the eight percent there of uh, of, cus of um, companies who actually deliver uh, this superior experience. Uh, one thing Bain and company found was that uh, these uh, um, companies have in common that they have a full commitment to treating uh, their profitable customers uh, in the right way, so they will return and even recommend uh, the services of the company to others. And this is actually a very very central point and this. This is uh, something that we, we today see that the user-centered approach is something a lot of people talk about. It is the standard way when you want to deliver cutting-edge digital products because you need to align on a world that is constantly moving and constantly asking for something different. You really need to, to make sure you have a, a, a finger on the pulse um, because in the end, the user is what, who decides the, the worth of your product. If the user thinks that they have more value in another product or by a, a competitor's product, they will not buy yours. So aligning with the customers who are actually paying for your products is the utmost important thing when you're actually uh, starting to, to develop a new product. Um, all right, we'll uh, we'll move on. So um, to to get a bit more uh, concrete about how how you can actually uh, can apply this this kind of thinking into into your uh, process is first of all define your users. Uh, who will be using this product? Is it aimed for children? Is it aimed for elderly people? Is it aimed for people with low or high level of technical knowledge? Because this is all something that that you need to to think about when you convey the the user interface to the user. How much do you need to hold people's hand is it is it someone who has a lot a large uh, amount of experience with touch interfaces who, who just wants to go on and solve his task or is it someone who are quite new to this technology and maybe needs some more guidance as you go uh, as as the user goes through um Another thing that you really need to, to have an eye on is, is this product movable or is it fixed on a wall? Because um, movable products can usually be placed a bit closer to your face and to your eyes than, than things on the wall. Um, it really depends on the height, of course, but uh, yeah, funny thing, people are, di are different heights. So something that is movable usually have, um, let's say, uh, um, let's say have a, have a, usually have the same distance to, to, to people's eyes and things that are, are fixed on a, on the wall. So this is something you need, need to be aware of when you're choosing a button sizes and text sizes, for example. Another thing, of course, is are you working with, with a product in, in an industrial setting or is it something for private use? Because in industrial settings, if it's a product that a user wants to to solve a task multiple times a day and maybe for, for an extended period of time, he really wants something that is fast and efficient and really uh, supports the task that he has at hand. Um, while on the other hand, if you if you're designing for private use, uh, usually we go for a bit more flair and we want uh, we want people to to really have a a, a great uh, great experience with this. So so this is uh, this is where we we um, we go a bit more into detail and really create a, a nice vibe to to the product because. And when you put something into your home or into your product, you start to to identify a little bit with the product. So it's important that it's something that looks good and feels good. Um, of course, we have the, the the size and the text of buttons, and this is something uh, I think a great example is is the car displays today. Uh, some of you uh, have might have even tried these because um, the size of text and buttons on car displays today is most of the time absolutely horrendous. It's 
um, it's really hard to to uh, uh, take a quick glance at uh, at text on these displays when you're driving the car. You can't really look at the display for five seconds at a time because you need to watch the road as well. So the size of text and the ability to actually hit these buttons when you're driving down a, a bumpy road, as you usually do, uh, it can it can actually uh, help quite a bit to keep these in, in mind when you're designing the user interface. Um, one thing uh, I, I wanted to to uh, to include. I uh, hope you see my uh, my little uh, display over here with the uh, with the washer. Um, is uh, is that this uh, this um, uh, demo that we did is of course uh, aimed for being on a, a washing machine. Um, so in this case, we were actually uh, having a display that were mounted uh, on a on a fixed surface. So we we should actually be be able to to read this at, at, as a larger distance that we would if people could have, have it uh, at face level. Um, so the, the difference here is of course is this something that is 30 centimeters from your face? Is it something I can hold in my hand or is it one meter away um, when the when the washing machine is at uh, my uh, at the height of my hip? So um, the the decision we did here uh, regarding text and icon sizes were actually um, we actually decided on, on the the distance that the most users would have to the display. Of course, I can start it for for a bit <laughs> for a bit flare, keep you entertained at home. All right, so and you have. Yeah, yes, we have a question from one in the audience. Um, how much uh, does the geographical culture of users around the world impact the GUI design? Um, it can actually mean quite a lot. Um, usually what we want to, to define when we get a customer in our house is actually are we, uh, are we uh, aiming for a Western audience? Are we aiming for a Europeans or an American uh, market? Uh, or are we looking for an Asian market or maybe even a third one? Because uh, especially the, uh, the Western market and, and the Asian market, it really has uh, different approaches to uh, what a good UI is. Uh, um, so it, it it actually matters quite a lot who you're designing it for, and it really underlines the importance of asking who are the main, uh, who are the users, and who are the target audience uh, for this product. All right, so uh, I'll uh, I'll move on and actually sum these uh, these uh, context tips up a bit for you before we we go into the next one. Um, so uh, of course keep the focus on on your end end users and you should actually do this throughout your development. It's not something you can just do in the start and then think that the the world will stand still while you develop your product. You still need to to uh, to talk to your users as you go through, and it can actually be a very good idea to talk to your users and test the ideas that that you have as you go on, test uh, maybe some quick uh, prototypes and receive some feedback because this, this can actually help you stay on the right track as you develop it because a lot of ideas will, will come up and, and uh, be either integrated or bounce off your product uh, or, or, your, or, or your project as you develop it. So you really need to make sure that the right things get into your product and the, the wrong things are, are kept out. Uh, and again, the users will decide what these right and wrong things will be. Um, and just uh, just to, to give a quick example as well, um, usually what we do is, is kick off a project a project uh, with user research um, and maybe a, a workshop to actually gain some domain knowledge uh, before we actually start to do wireframes and before we start to do the the, the, the graphic design for the UI um, because this can actually help us uh, guide this process a lot and make sure that we are aligning with the customer uh, again because we want to build the right thing from the start. All right. So the next uh, the next point up is uh, performance and uh, and hardware. And uh, of course, this is uh, something that uh, matters quite a lot, especially on uh, in, in these uh, low cost uh, microprocessors. Um, so one thing you need to keep in mind when you're developing your your UI is actually considering these performance options early. And this is not because you cannot uh, do beautiful stuff and do high-end graphics on on low and on low end hardware but it's because you need to to uh, to know what the limits are uh, in your hardware um 
so you can actually play to the strengths and not the, the weaknesses uh, of the hardware. Um, of course, uh, a framework like TouchGFX is actually amazing in this regard because it, it actually uh, delivers uh, some flexible solutions to how you can approach different problems. So uh, sometimes when uh, if you have a, a, a very uh, low cost um, low cost uh, processor that can't really do the animations that you want, uh, you might uh, consider doing uh, stuff like uh, animated Im images instead and actually hand uh, hand animate uh, each image. And this is actually something that we did for for uh, for the the, uh, the washer prototype. So if I start uh, to uh, do a wash, you will see that the the center circle will expand a little bit. And this is something that is actually quite uh, hard to do uh, with uh, most low-cost hardware, the, the scaling of different objects, because you need to calculate the, the, the size as it grows, and this can be quite straining on hardware, and your frame rate, frame rate will really take a hit. But if you, if you do this in images instead and actually hand-draw the development of this, uh, this animation, you can use the animated image uh, widget in TouchGFX, uh, which is very, very cost efficient uh, on your hardware. You're just making the software do the work instead. And this is actually something that is, that is quite nice with uh, with TouchGFX. Um, another thing you need to consider on your on your hardware is, of course, what are the color color possibilities uh, on the display. Uh, are you working with the 4-bit displays with 16 colors? Are you working with 24-bit with 16 million colors? Because this is something that really has a, a lot to say when you're when you're developing the UI. The UI. Of course, this is not to say that you can't make a great UI on a, on the lower bit. Uh, displays uh, in the in the corner of this slide, you for example see our Somfy uh, design. It quite has a, a few years on the back, uh, um, but I think uh, I think it's it still looks it look, looks quite good, uh, and and the black and white can really uh, make a, a UI design quite simple. Um, so less is uh, or more is not necessarily better when it comes to colors. Um, uh, another thing we get asked about once in a while is viewing angles. Uh, I won't be covering this uh, today because uh, have a, we have a tight schedule, um, but we have a, a webinar uh, later in the fall. Uh, it's called Choosing the Right Display. So if you think this is something that applies to you, you might uh, consider signing up for this. Um, all right, I think uh, we're ready to move on to uh, to the tips for performance. Um, of course, you you want to avoid uh, these disappointments um, that can uh, can be in in really developing a great looking UI on your four thousand uh, dollar iMac uh, monitor, and then when you when you flash it on your display, uh, you realize that you only have sixteen colors and everything uh, doesn't look uh, quite as well as you imagined it. So it's it's a very good idea to actually check early if your uh, graphical design will actually uh, will actually look as great as you, as you think it will another thing you want to do is uh, is work closely with the developer uh, developers and this is to identify the options you have not only in the hardware but actually touch the effects itself because usually the hardware of course poses some limits on what you can do but the solutions to, to these limits and the solutions to different problems you have during development often lies in the software that you use. And this is where TouchGFX and the flexibility that comes with TouchGFX is actually something that can help the, the UX and the UI designer uh, try to accompany this into the design. So you're not giving your developers a hard time later on, but you can actually play to the strengths of, of the hardware and the software that you're using. Of course, you you want to evaluate your performance as you go, um, and this is uh, to identify when you need to find alternative routes. Uh, I mentioned before, TouchGFX is flexible, so there's always a, a different approach uh, to solving a, a, a specific task. If you have a um, an animation that's a bit tricky, it's always a different way to do it. It's just a matter of identifying it. So this is is quite nice to to identify these as early as possible as well. Um, so one thing that I need to mention as well is, uh, of course, that performance should be tested on, on the hardware itself uh, and not the PC simulator. And this is uh, where the, the TouchGFX designer, I think uh, Saren will talk a bit uh, about it later as well. The ability to flash uh, something uh, quickly onto onto hardware uh, with the TouchGFX designer is something that makes it very, very quick to, to actually test this performance. Again, to make sure that you're not uh, you're not uh, uh, dreaming up something that can't be realized uh, on the hardware that you have chosen. 
Um, actually, while we are talking about Thursday FX designer, we have a question from one in the audience, and it's, it's actually uh, for you, Henrik. Uh, are you using the Thursday FX designer, and uh, how are you using it? Uh, I am using the TouchGFX Designer. Um, I use a, a bunch of other tools uh, as well, um, but the TouchGFX Designer really comes into play uh, when I get the, the UI designer involved. Um, so usually my process will be to, to sketch up uh, uh, very early, some very early drawings, and making the the skeleton of of the of the application. And as as we as we go in, uh, be uh, become more detail oriented, I start to get some graphical uh, assets, some images from my uh, from my UI designer that I can work with. Uh, then I can very quickly start to put these into into the TouchGFX designer and actually set up the the. The UI, as I imagine it will look uh, in the end, and I can quickly flash it to to the drive. I can do some quick animations if I want to test something out, uh, quick interactions as well. Um, so this actually helps me um, try out some some very early ideas ideas and actually prototype quite fast. And this is usually how you identify uh, and distinguish uh, good ideas from bad ideas. So this is this is where TouchGFX Designer really starts to uh, uh, to uh, make its worth. All right, we'll uh, jump on to uh, the next one. This is uh, rules and recognizability. Um, I mentioned it uh, as we started off as well. Uh, I need to say it again. Smartphones design define our rules for for touchscreen navigation. This is something that is um, really uh, really hard to get around because the frame of reference that users have today is the smartphone they have in their pocket. There's no way to get around this. Um, it's something we have to keep in mind when we, when we design embedded GUI. Um, um, one thing that uh, we we need to keep in mind as well is the expectations that comes uh, with the with this uh, smartphone mania, um, because smartphones of course uh, have uh, um, some hardware that can do uh, quite a bit more than than what we can in, in microprocessors, where we have something that so, uh, that costs a fraction of, of what a smartphone does. Um, but this does not really affect the the um, expectations users have and this can of course uh, sound a bit unfair um, but it's not something that uh, that sh should actually limit us uh, too much um, so when uh, when we when we're looking at the, at these uh, rules that is defined by smartphones is uh, we need to consider these well established conventions that we we see uh, see uh, around the uh, the app world right now and this is something that actually comes from a lot of web design as well uh, I, I brought a few examples uh, uh, in the text here. Um, the closing X is usually uh, put in the top right corner of uh, uh, of the window because this is where people will look. This is where they usually look when they need to close a window or need to go back in a menu. So um, another thing that, that uh, is important to consider here is the reading direction for at least most languages in the world uh, is from left to right and from top to down. So this is actually the uh, the direction that most people will scan the interface as well when they're trying to make sense of it or they're trying to identify where's the navigation, where's the content, where's the thing that I'm looking for right now. And actually having uh, having uh, these structured in a way that uh, the user can quickly identify them um, is something that uh, will strengthen uh, the uh, ability uh, for the user to navigate the interface. Um, and this leads us to what uh, we what we call a visual hierarchy. Um, this is uh, something that uh, we see in the example in the bottom here. Uh, something that can really help prioritize uh, what's going on on the screen uh, for the user. So on on the left uh, side where it says a weak visual hierarchy, uh, we have a, an example of a web page where uh, there's not really any titles. There's no distinguishing in what is content, what is navigation, uh, and this this can uh, on the one hand look very boring, uh, and on the other hand it, it really 
makes it hard for the user to quickly distinguish where should he look uh, for the, the thing he is looking for right now. Um, on the right hand side we have the strong visual hierarchy uh, where the the top bar is quickly marked out and this might have some navigation, maybe a search field um, and then the content comes uh, comes along as he moves down the, the UI. So uh, this uh, this reading direction point is usually why people put uh, the the navigation in the top of the screen or on the left side because this is where people will will look uh, in the in the first place when they're trying to to uh, see how they can navigate this interface. Um, one example that we can we can do here as well. Uh, I'll return to uh, to our washing uh, demo over here. Um, is uh, in uh, the visual hierarchy point um, because what we uh, what we imagined when we uh, did this uh, this um, washing machine demo uh, was that for most people using a washing machine, it, it really comes down to quickly identifying the washing program you're looking for and then starting the starting the the um, the wash. It's not a lot of nitty-gritty details that you want to go into. Maybe you do, but not necessarily what you what you are looking for. Um, so we wanted the main part of the screen to be made of of the most important thing in the interface, and this is of course the washing programs. So we have a central part of the screen where we can choose the program that we're looking for and we can start the wash right away. So in this way we have already prioritized the content of the UI for the user and it makes it easy to find uh, exactly what he, he needs at that time. All right, I'll just uh, sum up the uh, rules and uh, recognizability tips, and uh, I'll get back to you, Son, so you can uh, you can ask your question. Um, first of all, uh, get inspired by smartphone uh, UI design. There's a lot of great things out there. There's a lot of things that people have spent hundreds and thousands of hours on on designing and and thinking out. So it's a great place to get inspired because this is this is the reference that people will have when they're using your interface as well. So it's a great place to to check out uh, if you're looking for different uh, or alternative solutions to what you're already already making. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is check if you're following the, the rules. If you're breaking any conventions, breaking any rules, you really need to think about why you're doing it and if it is necessary. Because each time you break a rule, it will make the user stop and think, what went wrong here or what do I need to be aware of? If it's not important that the user does this, then it can really start to get frustrating that things are not as the user expects. And then of course, in the end, take advantage of a strong visual hierarchy and actually guide the user uh, throughout your application. You really want um, a flow uh, throughout the throughout the application and help the user solve the task that he's, uh, he's trying to, to, uh, to accomplish. And then I'll get uh, get back to you, Sarn. Great, and uh, thank you, Hanai. Um, before we move on to the next uh, topic, uh, we would like to launch one more poll and uh, hear more about who's making the user experience design at your company. Uh, I'll launch it now, and you can try and uh, and uh, and then put it in what uh, who's making the UX at your company. And uh, meanwhile, uh, Henrik, uh, maybe you can share more about uh, how you're working together with uh, with the TrustFX developer, the embedded developer, and you. Um, how do you uh, secure that uh, that the relationship is good and uh, yeah, uh, you're getting the best product? Yeah, and I actually think it's a it's a great question. It's it's a it's a it's a, it's a great question because it, it's a hard one to answer. It really comes down to to uh, to what the structure is of your company. Um, I'm quite lucky to to have access to uh, to my developers uh, uh, pretty much all day, every day. Um, so what I I do when I I get an idea and if I want to check if something is is uh, is uh, something that can be realized on the final hardware because. I'm not an expert on hardware. Uh, I know a bit of TouchGFX, but I'm not a developer uh, either way. I, I don't uh, I don't code. I don't uh, do C++. So I need people around me that are experts on these fields. Um, so what I usually do is actually go down and insanity check uh, my my design with a with a developer before I put in too much uh, time and effort uh, into the direction that I'm heading. Because I want to make sure that this product is uh, is something that 
of course can be realized, but I also want the input from the developer because usually he sees some uh, some different opportunities and different ways of, of doing this um, so that can actually help uh, benefit the the final uh, user experience, something I can incorporate into my, my design. So that back and forth with the developer, I think is is a very, very healthy re relationship and something that you should, you should strive for. Um, at least uh, at least uh, as much as your company structure allows it. Great, and thank you. Uh, and we can see here that 75% of you uh, is actually the software developer doing the user experience part of uh, the, the GUI. And uh, I think it would be worth mentioning uh, here that uh, th this is actually the beginning of a webinar series. Um, <clears throat> the topics today is uh, high-level speaking and uh, we will do more webinars in the future diving into specific topics and uh, later on in this webinar we'll also uh, try and get some input from from you about what you think is relevant to learn more about um, so we can plan more webinars and uh, equip you more to make a yeah a fantastic uh, embedded product um, yeah that's uh, yeah but, uh, please proceed uh, and I can... yep Without further ado, I will. Um, so the next one uh, that comes up is uh, the consistency. This is of course something that um, overlaps a bit with my with my previous point about the rules and and, and uh, recognizability, because you want to be consistent with the choices that you have in the UI. So if you're following any rules, if you're following uh, conventions, and I really hope you are at least following some conventions, um, then you need to be consistent with these choices. Because um, generally speaking, um, the the more the user has to learn about this interface, uh, the the less he, he or the further way he has from actually taking a full advantage of the product if it's uh, hard to to uh, to reach new features or it's it, it maybe it's hard to understand how to how to really use them uh, chances are he won't use them at all and and in that way your shiny new feature actually won't have any value for this customer because he's not using it um, so in that way it's, it's really important to to be consistent and make the 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 uh, minimize the learning that the the user has to to do to actually use this product um, but because, because of course something that uh, you, uh, you often can forget is that the user is not just navigating the the UI for 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 fun. Uh, it's not the goal uh, for for him to just poke around in your UI. Uh, it rarely will be, at least. Um, he's actually using your UI to solve a task. Maybe it's operating a, a washing machine over here. Maybe it's buying a ticket. Maybe it's um, turning on a light. Uh, maybe it's operating. Uh, an industrial machine. He's uh, he's trying to 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 solve a task uh, in the real world, and the the user interface is a, is a, a gateway to actually doing this. Um, so it's very important to to make the uh, the UI uh, as invisible and as possible in this regard. Uh, you don't want the user to to think too much and learn too much about how to navigate this. It should be come it should come as natural as possible. And this is of course uh, something that can uh, can be done uh, by actually using some uh, some uh, some conscious uh, tricks uh, because there's a lot of clues in the visual design that can actually guide the user. Uh, one that's brought up very often is uh, is the color red. Um, color red usually means that you're canceling something, you're going back, you're closing something. So uh, by integrating the color red uh, into your design, you can very quickly, and of course integrating it in the right places, you can very quickly guide the user to to places where he uh, where he can see that he he's going back. So in that way, you incorporate these uh, very uh, natural uh, subconscious things into the UI um, that that makes it a bit easier uh, for the user to to uh, to come by. Um, to sum up uh, some of these uh, into a bit, uh, some easy to read tips uh, is of course uh, that you need to design um, for the user's expectations. Um, if the user is always um, uh, surprised by what is happening in the UI because things are not consistent, uh, he will stop and think each time and it will actually interrupt the task that he's trying to solve. It will interrupt the flow he has of buying that ticket or setting uh, or, or washing those clothes or operating that machine. 
And this actually makes a, a very bad user experience quite fast. So it's important to, to keep these expectations in mind uh, when you're designing the flow throughout the, the application. Another thing, of course, you want to be consistent in is uh, the graphical design. Uh, you need to be consistent uh, with the, the colors, and the shapes, the icons, the typography that you use, because this is, again, something that the user will try to get familiar with. And as soon as you, as you break this balance, the user will stop and think, why did you do that? Uh, is there a reason for this? And should I be aware of something? And if there's not, this will get quite frustrating very, very fast. Um, Another thing you need to be consistent is, of course, the, the general navigation, uh, the menu structure, the position of buttons should be consistent. Uh, again, so the user can, can find a natural way around the UI. Uh, if he needs to stop and identify, how do I get out of this screen? Or how do I uh, continue throughout this screen each single time? It can become a very, very uh, tedious product uh, or a very t uh, tedious um, task to, to do. Um, of course, in the end, you need pretty much to make the UI predictable. Um, and uh, we can actually compare this to, to driving uh, driving uh, down a road. Because um, driving down a road uh, with a good visibility, no sharp turns, is actually uh, a bit more in, uh, enjoyable uh, than driving down something that has very narrow roads. You never know what is coming up. Uh, because this is really interrupting your, your flow on, on, on the road. Uh, you really want to see what is ahead. And the user has the same way here. He wants to see uh, the path uh, to, to actually solving uh, the task he, ha he has at hand. That brings us to uh, the last point for uh, for today, or at least for me, uh, and this is a responsiveness and animation uh, in embedded GUI design. Um, one thing uh, I need to mention here uh, can be a bit uh, philosophical, uh, but. Uh, on, on the bottom, humans are very communicative uh, creatures. Um, we're always looking for, for feedback for, for the actions that we do uh, uh, in the world. Uh, one example is that if I'm talking to Soren, I, I'll become very frustrated, frustrated quickly uh, he, if he does not recognize that he's listening to me. Uh, if he doesn't keep eye contact, if he's doing something else and not really uh, acknowledging the things that I'm saying to him, I'll be frustrated. Uh, a lot uh, earlier than I actually uh, think I will. Um, and it's the exact same way with, with uh, user interfaces, actually. We expect things to, to give us some feedback until uh, that the action you just did, it actually matters. And it actually uh, got registered by me. Because um, when, when this fails, uh, and you've probably uh, tried it before, uh, clicking around on your, on your desktop, or on your mobile phone, as soon as uh, as you don't get feedback, as soon as uh, nothing happens when you tap the screen or touch the mouse, you think that something broke. Uh, the maybe the the application has frozen. Uh, maybe the product is dodgy. So you really need to con to constantly deliver this feedback because it's actually very vital to to make a UI feel responsive uh, when you're providing this uh, this uh, user experience and actually providing a, a good one um, to do, do this uh, in a very uh, let's say in a low a low level way is actually uh, providing press states for all your buttons maybe all your sliders as well make sure that when the user touches a button he can uh, see a, a slight movement uh, with uh, with the images that there's another image for the press state so he can identify that ah I, I pressed this button and the interface knows I did that will make him happy for a while. So that's a, that's a, a good thing to incorporate. Uh, another thing uh, that we're covering in this point is animation. Uh, animation, of course, is something we see all around uh, different mobile apps. And you can't really uh, open one of the big apps today without everything being riddled with animation. Small fades, small uh, bubbles coming, coming up and uh, dimming the screen, fading out again. Everything is moving all the time, and it can be very um, you can be very tempted to to incorporate this into into your embedded GUI design uh, right away as well. As I mentioned earlier, one thing that we need to consider when uh, doing embedded products that have a quite a long lifetime uh, is that animation on uh, on smartphones can get updated. Uh, 
pretty much every week, every month, and uh, you will see this change in in the apps that you use today. And what we see today is not the same what we will see in one year. But on embedded uh, in, in embedded products, um, and these can have a lifetime. Uh, we usually see five to ten years. I've seen fifteen years as well. This is actually a very very long time, and it makes it quite hard to actually do something that you know uh, will last uh, throughout the ages. Um, one uh, one ref reference I brought uh, for you today is uh, the most mo sold mobile phone of 2005. So this is 13 years ago. We haven't even reached the the 15 years lifetime uh, yet. This is the the Nokia 1110. Uh, maybe some of you remember it. Maybe some of you owned it. Um, but this is uh, quite far away from the the expectations to mobile phones uh, that we have today. Um, and this is just to give you a, a little visual idea on how long uh, 5, 10 or 15 years can actually be. Um, so what we usually do when we add animations to our, our embedded UIs is actually considering uh, is this just a trendy animation? Is this uh, is this something that uh, has uh, has been around for a while, or is it just the newest, uh, craziest animation that we need to to incorporate because just because, or is it because we actually are trying to to incorporate uh, some some life uh, into into the uh, the um, the application and actually uh, having small subtle animations uh, that won't really take too much attention from the user but it's all these small micro interactions all these small micro animations that can really gather uh, up and and deliver a great user experience um, so one uh, one advice I would have for you is really look out for for these long animations that we see once in a while animations that last half and whole seconds those can really add up and start to get annoying, especially in five years' time uh, when uh, we have a, a completely different expectation to waiting times. Um, so it's really important to to not keep the user waiting for too long when you when you add animations. Make them be snappy and make them be uh, uh, a bit subtle, so so the user won't be frustrated with them. Um, and just to sum up this uh, this point uh, is uh, provide the feedback for your users. Uh, use press state on buttons, uh, messages if something changed that the user needs to be aware of, and constantly make sure that the user uh, understands that the user uh, the the UI is uh, is uh, is talking back to the user. Um, making sure that everything is okay and his actions are, are actually being registered right now. Um, you know, of course need to to avoid this uh, this use of frustration uh, and this is is by actually just letting the user know that the UI interactions have an effect um, last but not least animations are quite important especially uh, today when the the expectations from mobile phones is that animations are everywhere but really uh, consider that you're not only uh, incorporating uh, trends because they are trendy right now but try to 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 think of the whole product lifetime and incorporate something that won't be uh, completely annoying in in a year or two or something that that won't really uh, won't really last the the whole lifetime without becoming uh, at least looking very very obsolete I think that was uh, it for me at least for now of course if you have uh, have more questions please uh, throw throw them in and we'll have a QA in a, in a few minutes uh, Saren uh, told me he just wanted to to say a few words uh, so I'll just uh, give the word to you Saren thank you Henrik um, please change the slide oh you have thank you uh, while talking about the trusty effect designer uh, we'll just launch a poll uh, quickly and just to see if you are using a market or user research to secure your product success please uh, put in your vote and uh, let's see what the outcome will be um, and uh, after this we will uh, talk a bit about uh, the trust effect designer um, how we are using it and how uh, also Henrik is, is using this uh, especially in user tests um, and how fast and, and easily it can be done uh, I can see we already at 70 80 percent uh, vote ratio so uh, let's uh, close it and i'll share the result with you um i can see a lot of you are not doing uh, user and market research so maybe this should could be a topic that we should uh, discover later on 
Um, if it should be, please let us know, uh, and we'll do a poll uh, later on also uh, to get your inputs on what could be relevant. Um, yes, back to uh, the designer. Just to give you a quick idea uh, about the designer, the touch effect designer with, uh, with this, you can easily and uh, fast create a simple UI. And uh, you can simply choose a board, uh, a pre-supported board by Just the Effects and, and build a UI. It doesn't has, have to be the most fancy one with the greatest graphics, but um, you can, in a few minutes, already get started. Um, and maybe, Henrik, you can explain more about how you're using the designer to do user tests um, and iterization also. Uh, yes, uh, I think I mentioned uh, a bit earlier uh, when in the process that I actually start to uh, to use the touch the effect designer, and this is uh, usually when the uh, when the dis uh, the UI designer starts delivering some assets to me, some images uh, that has this feel of of a final application. Um, what touch the effects designer really allows me to do is quickly flash it onto some hardware, uh, not necessarily the the end hardware that I'll use for the product. Uh, uh, but just the, the the same size of screen is often enough, um, and when I have this on my hardware, it is it's pretty much only uh, only the the fantasy that that uh, sets the limits for for what we can do. Uh, you can go out and talk to users and actually uh, ask them ab about how they experience this. Uh, if some of you uh, read our our case uh, on uh, on uh, a customer uh, Nico uh, that we uh, engaged uh, during Embedded World this year. Um, Nico uh, invited us, uh, uh, or we invited uh, Nico to uh, to partner up in a in a workshop uh, during Embedded World uh, in three days and actually build a, a prototype. And uh, one of the things that we talked about, Nico, is that uh, we wanted uh, on something on day two. So when we were halfway through the the process, we wanted something that we can put onto a, uh, some hardware and actually go out and ask people, how do you experience this, and how can we make it even better? Uh, and this was something that the, the Touch the Effects designer actually allowed us to to do was very quickly uh, build up a, a, a rough. Um, a rough interface uh, on, on the UI, flashing it on some hardware, go out and test it, just immediately come back, do the changes, and then you could go out again and ask some more. And the the amount of iterations uh, can actually uh, can actually deliver uh, quite a lot of feedback and really give give you a good feel of what direction you should take your product. Um, great, and thank you, Henrik. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? Um, to give you something from this webinar which you can use, uh, Henrik and uh, Kim has made a PDF file um, with yeah, sharing some of the UI and UX wisdom. Uh, and please check this out. Uh, we've made a handout which you can see uh, beneath uh, the question pane. And you can download this. And if you can't see it or uh, didn't receive it, please let me know. We will also share this after the webinar. Uh, great. Um, please, the next slide, Henrik. Um, the Trust Effects Designer is also available um, online in a free evaluation version. Uh, please visit trustyeffects.com. You can also see the link in the chat uh, for this download. Um, getting more support, uh, knowledge base, and so on, you can visit our health center. We have basic uh, knowledge base articles, videos, examples, and so on. You can, of course, write us, both uh, me and Henrik, um, and we will try and help you uh, move on. Um, and also, upcoming and previous webinars can also be found on our website. As I mentioned, we will do more of, of these webinars uh, later on, but we will also do uh, more on the embedded side, uh, the developer side, uh, on hardware integration, for example, and this uh, will be done next week. Uh, so please sign up if, if this is relevant for you. Um, we will also do another poll here just to see what you think could be a relevant topic to discover in this line of webinar regarding the UI and UX. Um, so I'll just launch a poll here and please uh, give your input here. If this doesn't cover what you think could be relevant, uh, please use the chat or the questions uh, just to uh, give us a quick answer on what you think is relevant. Uh, this is good input for us and uh, uh, useful for uh, for future roadmap planning for for webinars. So uh, so please let us know. So we uh, yeah and they are coming. I can see. 
we have a lot of from idea to finished product and responsiveness and animations. Uh, I'll just close it now and uh, you can also see the results of those. Um, yeah, this is also the results most likely from, uh, from the, our earlier webinar today. So uh, we will take this into consideration and uh, yeah, please stay tuned in uh, on our, on our uh, website. Great. Um, next uh, slide, please, Henrik. Uh, we are online after the webinar also. It will end in a few minutes. Uh, try to answer all your, uh, your, your remaining questions, either in voice or in writing. And uh, you can also write us an email if you have any questions. Um, next. Um, yeah, and uh, thank you for, uh, for attending this webinar and being active. Um, more is to come in the future, and uh, we hope to uh, contribute contribute to uh, in your making of a success, uh, successful product. Um, and we will wish you a great day or evening, uh, depending on where you are. And uh, hope to see you again next time. Uh, yeah, maybe you have a, a last uh, thing to say, Henrik. Yeah, I do. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in, guys. I uh, hope you got something for it. Uh, if you have a question or uh, anything that you, uh, any uh, uh, interest point that you thought we should talk a bit more about, just qu uh, quickly uh, leave a, a comment or a question uh, below, and uh, we'll talk a bit more uh, online um, with you before we all head off. But uh, have a great evening, guys. Yeah, and you can see an email address here, touch the effects uh, info at drobnographics.com. Please write us and, uh, and let us know what you think. And if you have any questions, feel free to, uh, to fire away. Uh, yeah. Bye bye from here.